Hi friends, and thank you for joining us in this nightly read-along. Don't forget to ask your parent to subscribe so you don't miss any future chapters. Now here's Miss Kate with tonight's chapters. Chapter 14, The First Miracle Matilda sat down again at her desk. The trench bull seated herself behind the teacher's table. It was the first time she had sat down during the lesson. Then she reached out a hand and took hold of her water jug. Still holding the jug by the handle, but not lifting it yet, she said, I have never been able to understand why small children are so disgusting. They are the bane of my life. They are like insects. They should be got rid of as early as possible. We get rid of flies with fly spray and by hanging up fly paper. I've often thought of inventing a spray for getting rid of small children. How splendid it would be to walk into this classroom with a gigantic spray gun in my hands and start pumping it. Or better still, some huge strips of sticky paper. I would hang them all around the school and you'd all get stuck to them and that would be the end of it. Wouldn't that be a good idea, Miss Honey? If it's meant to be a joke, headmistress, I don't think it's a very funny one, Miss Honey said from the back of the class. You wouldn't, would you, Miss Honey, the Trunchbull said, and it's not meant to be a joke. My idea of a perfect school, Miss Honey, is one that has no children in it at all. One of these days, I shall start up a school like that. I think it will be very successful. The woman's mad, Miss Honey was telling herself. She's round the twist. She's the one who ought to be got rid of. The trench bowl now lifted the large blue porcelain water jug and poured some water into her glass. And suddenly, with the water, out came the long, slimy newt straight into the glass. Plop. The trench bowl let out a yell and leapt off her chair as though a firecracker had gone off underneath her. And now the children also saw the long, thin, slimy, yellow-bellied, lizard-like creature twisting and turning in the glass. And they squirmed and jumped about as well, shouting, What is it? Oh, it's disgusting. It's a snake. It's a baby crocodile. It's an alligator. Look out, Miss Trunchbull, cried Lavender. I'll bet it bites. The Trunchbull, this mighty female giant, stood there in her green breeches, quivering like a blanc mange. She was especially furious that someone had succeeded in making her jump and yell like that because she prided herself on her toughness. She stared at the creature, twisting and wriggling in the glass. Curiously enough, she had never seen a newt before. Natural history was not her strong point. She hadn't the faintest idea what this thing was. It certainly looked extremely unpleasant. Slowly, she sat down again in her chair. She looked at this moment more terrifying than ever before. The fires of fury and hatred were smoldering in her small black eyes. Matilda, she barked, stand up. Who, me? Matilda said. What have I done? Stand up, you disgusting little cockroach. I haven't done anything, Miss Trunchbull. Honestly, I haven't. I've never seen that slimy thing before. Stand up at once, you filthy little maggot. Reluctantly, Matilda got to her feet. She was in the second row. Lavender was in the row behind her, feeling a bit guilty. She hadn't intended to get her friend into trouble. On the other hand, she was certainly not about to own up. You are a vile, repulsive, repellent, malicious little brute, the Trunchbull was shouting. You are not fit to be in this school. You ought to be behind bars. That's where you ought to be. I shall have you drummed out of this establishment in utter disgrace. I shall have the prefect chase you down the corridor and out of the front door with hockey sticks. I shall have the staff escort you home under armed guard. And then I shall make absolutely sure you are sent to a reformatory for delinquent girls for the m minimum of 40 years. The trench bowl was in such a rage that her face had taken on a boiled color of little and little flecks of froth were gathering at the corners of her mouth. But she was not the only one who was losing her cool. Matilda was also beginning to see red. She didn't in the least mind being accused of having done something she had actually done. She could see the justice of that. It was, however, a totally new experience for her to be accused of a crime that she definitely had not committed. She had had absolutely nothing to do with that beastly creature in the glass. By golly, she thought, that rotten trunch bowl isn't going to pin this one on me. I did not do it, she screamed. Oh, yes, you did, the trunch bowl roared back. Nobody else could have thought up a trick like that. Your father was right to warn me about you. The woman seemed to have lost control of herself completely. She was ranting like a maniac. You are finished in this school, young lady, she shouted. You are finished everywhere. I shall personally see to it that you are put away in a place where not even the crows can land their droppings on you. You will probably never see the light of day again. I'm telling you I did not do it, Matilda screamed. I've never even seen a creature like that in my life. You have put a, a, a crocodile in my drinking water, the trench bull yelled back. There is no worse crime in the world against the headmistress. Now sit down and don't say a word. Go on, sit down at once. But I'm telling you, Matilda shouted, refusing to sit down. 
I am telling you to shut up, the trunch bull roared. If you don't shut up at once and sit down, I shall remove my belt and let you have it with the end of that, with the end that has a buckle. Slowly, Matilda sat down. Oh, the rottenness of it all, the unfairness. How dare they expel her for something she hadn't done? Matilda felt herself getting angrier and angrier and angrier, so unbearably angry that something was bound to explode inside her very soon. The newt was still squirming in the tall glass of water. It looked horribly uncomfortable. The glass was not big enough for it. Matilda glared at the trunch bowl. How she hated her. She glared at the glass with the newt in it. She longed to march up and grab the glass and tip the contents, newt and all, over the trunch bowl's head. She trembled to think what the trunch bowl would do to her if she did that. The trunch bowl was sitting behind the teacher's table, staring with a mixture of horror and fascination at the newt wriggling in the glass. Matilda's eyes were also riveted on the glass. And now, quite slowly, there began to creep over Matilda a most extraordinary and peculiar feeling. The feeling was mostly in the eyes. A kind of electricity seemed to be gathering inside them. A sense of power was brewing in those eyes of hers. A feeling of great strength was settling itself deep inside her eyes. But there was also another feeling, which was something else altogether, and which she could not understand. It was like flashes of lightning. Little waves of lightning seemed to be flashing out of her eyes. Her eyeballs were beginning to get hot, as though vast energy was building up somewhere inside them. It was an amazing sensation. She kept her eyes steadily on the glass, and now the power was concentrating itself in one small part of each eye and growing stronger and stronger, and it felt as though millions of tiny little invisible arms with hands on them were shooting out of her eyes toward the glass she was staring at. Tip it, Matilda whispered. Tip it over. She saw the glass wobble. It actually tilted backwards a fraction of an inch, then righted itself. She kept pushing at it with all of those millions of invisible little arms and hands that were reaching out from her eyes, feeling the power that was flashing straight from the two little black dots in the very centers of her eyeballs. Tip it, she whispered again. Tip it over. Once more, the glass wobbled. She pushed harder still, willing her eyes to shoot out more power. And then, very, very slowly, so slowly she could hardly see it happening, the glass began to lean backwards, farther and farther and farther backwards, until it was balancing on just one edge of its base. And there, it teetered for a few seconds before finally toppling over and falling with a sharp tinkle on the desktop. The water in it and the squirming newt splashed out all over Miss Trunchbull's enormous bosom. The headmistress let out a yell that must have rattled every window pane in the building, and for the second time in the last five minutes, she shot out of her chair like a rocket. The newt clutched desperately at the cotton smock where it covered the great chest, and there it clung with its little claw-like feet. The trench bull looked down and saw it, and she bellowed even louder, and with a swipe of her hand, she sent the creature flying across the classroom. It landed on the floor beside Lavender's desk, and very quickly, she ducked down and picked it up and put it into her pencil box for another time. A newt, she decided, was a useful thing to have around. The trunch bull, her face more like a boiled ham than ever, was standing before the class quivering with fury. Her massive bosom was heaving in and out, and the splash of water down the front of it made a dark wet patch that had probably soaked right through to her skin. Who did it? She roared. Come on, own up. Step forward. You won't escape this. Who is responsible for this dirty job? Who pushed over this glass? Nobody answered. The whole room remained silent as a tomb. Matilda, she roared. It was you. I know it was you. Matilda, in the second row, sat very still and said nothing. A strange feeling of serenity and confidence was sweeping over her, and all of a sudden she found that she was frightened by nobody in the world. With the power of her eyes alone, she had compelled a glass of water to tip and spill its contents over the horrible headmistress, and anybody who could do that could do anything. Speak up, you clotted carbuncle, roared the trunch bowl. Admit that you did it. Matilda looked right back into the flashing eyes of this infuriated female giant and said with total calmness, I have not moved away from my desk, Miss Trunchbull, since the lesson began. I can say no more. Suddenly, the entire class seemed to rise up against the headmistress. She didn't move, they cried out. Matilda didn't move. Nobody moved. You must have knocked it over yourself. I most certainly did not knock it over myself, roared the trunch bowl. How dare you suggest a thing like that? Speak up, Miss Honey. You must have seen everything. Who knocked over my glass? None of the children did, Miss Trunchbull, Miss Honey answered. I can vouch for it that nobody has moved from his or her desk all the time you've been here, except for Nigel, and he has not moved from his corner. Miss Trunchbull glared at Miss Honey. Miss Honey met her gaze without flinching. I am telling you the truth, headmistress, she said. You must have knocked it over without knowing it. That sort of thing is easy to do. 
I am fed up with you useless bunch of midgets, roared the Trunchbull. I refuse to waste any more of my precious time in here. And with that, she marched out of the classroom, slamming the door behind her. In the stunned silence that followed, Miss Honey walked up to the front of the class and stood behind her table. Phew, she said. I think we've had enough school for one day, don't you? The class is dismissed. You may all go out into the playground and wait for your parents to come and take you home. Chapter 15, The Second Miracle Matilda did not join the rush to get out of the classroom. After the other children had all disappeared, she remained at her desk, quiet and thoughtful. She knew she had to tell somebody about what had happened with the glass. She couldn't possibly keep a gigantic secret like that bottled up inside her. What she needed was just one person, one wise and sympathetic grown-up, who could help her to understand the meaning of this extraordinary happening. Neither her mother nor her father would be of any use at all. If they believed her story, and it was doubtful they would, they would almost certainly would f fail to realize what an astounding event it was that had taken place in the classroom that afternoon. On the spur of the moment, Matilda decided that the one person she would like to confide in was Miss Honey. Matilda and Miss Honey were now the only two left in the classroom. Miss Honey had seated herself at her table and was rifling through some papers. She looked up and said, Well, Matilda, aren't you going outside with the others? Matilda said, Please may I talk to you for a moment? Of course you may. What's troubling you? Something very peculiar has happened to me, Miss Honey. Miss Honey became instantly alert. Ever since the two disastrous meetings she had had recently about Matilda, the first with the headmistress and the second with the dreadful Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood, Miss Honey had been thinking a great deal about this child and wondering how she could help her. And now, here was Matilda, sitting in the classroom with a curiosity, exalted look on her face, and asking if she could have a private talk. Miss Honey had never seen her looking so wide-eyed and peculiar before. Yes, Matilda, she said. Tell me what has happened to you that is so peculiar. Miss Trunchbull isn't going to expel me, is she? Matilda asked, because it wasn't me who put that creature in her jug of water. I promise you it wasn't. I know it wasn't, Miss Honey said. Am I going to be expelled? I think not, Miss Honey said. The headmistress simply got a little overexcited, that's all. Good, Matilda said, but that isn't what I want to talk to you about. What do you want to talk to me about, Matilda? I want to talk to you about the glass of water with the creature in it, Matilda said. You saw it spilling all over Miss Trunchbull, didn't you? I did indeed. Well, Miss Honey, I didn't touch it. I never went near it. I know you didn't, Miss Honey said. You heard me telling the headmistress that it couldn't possibly have been you. Ah, oh, but it was me, Miss Honey, Matilda said. That's exactly what I want to talk to you about. Miss Honey paused and looked carefully at the child. I don't think I quite follow you, she said. I got so angry at being accused of something I hadn't done that I made it happen. You made what happen, Matilda? I made the glass tip over. I still don't quite understand what you mean, Miss Honey said gently. I did it with my eyes, Matilda said. I was staring at it and wishing it to tip, and then my eyes went all hot and funny, and some sort of power came out of them, and the glass just toppled over. Miss Honey continued to look steadily at Matilda through her steel-rimmed spectacles, and Matilda looked back at her just as steadily. I am still not following you, Miss Honey said. Do you mean you actually willed the glass to tip over? Yes, Matilda said, with my eyes. Miss Honey was silent for a moment. She did not think Matilda was meaning to tell a lie. It was more likely that she was simply allowing her vivid imagination to run away with her. You mean you were sitting where you are now, and you told the glass to topple over, and it did? Something like that, Miss Honey, yes. If you did that, then it is just about the greatest miracle a person has ever performed since the time of Jesus. I did it, Miss Honey. It is extraordinary, thought Miss Honey, how often small children have flights of fancy like this. She decided to put an end to it as gently as possible. Could you do it again? She asked, not unkindly. I don't know, Matilda said, but I think I might be able to. Miss Honey moved the now empty glass to the middle of the table. Should I put water in it? She asked, smiling a little. I don't think it matters, Matilda said. Very well, then. Go ahead and tip it over. It may take some time. Take all the time you want, Miss Honey said. I'm in no hurry. Matilda, sitting in the second row about 10 feet away from Miss Honey, put her elbows on the desk and cupped her face in her hands, and this time she gave the order right at the beginning. Tip, glass, tip, she ordered, but her lips didn't move and she made no sound. She simply shouted the words inside her head, and now she concentrated the whole of her mind and her brain and her will up into her eyes, and once again, but her much more quickly than before, she felt the electricity gathering and the power was beginning to surge and the hotness was coming into the eyeballs. And then 
the millions of tiny invisible arms with hands on them were shooting out toward the glass without making any sound at all. She kept on shouting inside her head for the glass to go over. She saw it wobble, then it tilted, then it toppled right over and fell with a tinkle on the tabletop not 12 inches from Miss Honey's folded arms. Miss Honey's mouth dropped open and her eyes stretched so wide you could see the whites all around. She didn't say a word. She couldn't. The shock of seeing the miracle performed had struck her dumb. She gaped at the glass, leaning well away from it now as though it might be a dangerous thing. Then, slowly, she lifted her head and looked at Matilda. She saw the child white in the face, as white as paper trembling all over. The eyes glazed, staring straight ahead and seeing nothing. The whole face was transfigured, the eyes round and bright. And she was sitting there speechless, quite beautiful, in a blaze of silence. Miss Honey waited, trembling a little herself, and watching the child as she slowly stirred herself back into consciousness. And then suddenly, click, went her face into a look of almost seraphic calm. I'm all right, she said, and smiled. I'm quite all right, Miss Honey, so don't be alarmed. You seem so far away, Miss Honey whispered, awestruck. Oh, I was. I was flying past the stars on silver wings, Matilda said. It was wonderful. Miss Honey was still gazing at the child in absolute wonderment, as though she were the creation, the beginning of the world, the first morning. It went much quicker this time, Matilda said quietly. It's not possible, Miss Honey was gasping. I don't believe it. I simply don't believe it. She closed her eyes and kept them closed for quite a while, and when she opened them again, it seemed as though she had gathered herself together. Would you like to come back and have tea at my cottage? She asked. Oh, I'd love to, Matilda said. Good. Gather up your things, and I'll meet you outside in a couple of minutes. You won't tell anyone about this, this thing that I did, will you, Miss Honey? I wouldn't dream of it, Miss Honey said.